there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. Welcome to a special edition of True News. Susan and I hope you're having a wonderful Christmas holiday week with family and friends. Where did 2016 go? We're down to only a few days remaining in the year. And Susan and I are very grateful for the support of the True News family of fans who generously donated to True News throughout 2016. Looking back, 2016 was a year of many blessings from heaven on this ministry. With God's grace, we launched Praiser in February 2016, the world's first advertiser-free, subscription-free Christian music streaming service. We built and equipped a video production studio. We purchased a church building in 10 acres. And we finally received our broadcast license from the St. Kitts government in the Caribbean to resume broadcasting on Radio Paradise to all the islands. We give the Lord all the credit and the glory and the honor for these achievements. If True News blessed you in 2016 and you desire to express your appreciation, please donate to True News by 11 59 p.m. Saturday, December 31st. And we will welcome with thanksgiving your show of support. You can do it online at truenews.com by clicking donate, or if you use PayPal, the address is support at truenews.com. If you're sending a check, a money order, or precious metals, the address is post office box. 690069 in Vero Beach, Florida. Our zip code is 32969. We're down to just the last few days of the year for you to show support for True News. And again, Susan and I will be greatly appreciative of your donations in the final hours of 2016. You know, when the Lord called me to this ministry in 1998, he led me to uh, the Old Testament prophets. And for most of the years of this ministry, I remained in the Old Testament prophets, in the books of the prophets, in particular, Jeremiah. I had never had those books speak to me like they did over the last um, really 16, 17, 18 years of of this ministry. And our good friend, Dr. C.R. Oliver, has recently published a commentary on the book of Jeremiah. The book is The Road to Captivity. And Dr. C.R. Oliver is going to spend today with me talking about what the Holy Spirit has shown him, the lessons, the wisdom, the insight that is found in the book of Jeremiah. It's been a long time since Dr. Oliver's been here. CR, welcome back to True News. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Rick. And I was going to say to your audience, uh, they can certainly trust your organization, your ministry to be just exactly what what you say it is. You've got people of integrity around you, and you are most in, filled with integrity, you and Susan both. And I want to thank you for the opportunity of being with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's an honor coming from you. Uh, we're just doing what the Lord told us to do, and we're not adding to it or taking away from it. or We're just doing our best to to 
be obedient to what he asks us to do in his name. He's blessed us along the way, C.R. Ministry is doing what God tells you to do, when he tells you to do it, to whom he tells you, and how he tells you. That's right. Other than that, it's man-made. That's right. So praise the Lord for your obedience. You know, C.R., uh, this is uh, before we start talking about your book, uh, The Road to Captivity. i got to tell you, uh, from time to time, when we have visitors, uh, uh, and I say visitors, um, people who come here who are deeply connected in the religious broadcasting, I call it the industrial complex, you know, the, the religious broadcasting world, they are always amazed that we operate by faith. And I don't know why that's so amazing, but it, it, it seems like very few major ministries today operate by faith. That's the problem, you see. There are there there is a definition that takes care of of both sides of that. Ministering to to the people is one thing, but ministering to God is another, and you do a share of both. And I think that makes a lot of difference. I know it does with the Lord because when it's his ministry he has the support available. May not always be like we like to see it or the, the timing we'd like to have, but it's there. Praise God for the provisions that have made you possible for your ministry, brother. Uh, take a moment and talk about uh, ministering to the Lord. Why, why? What is that, and why is that important? Well, I'm working on a book now uh, on Ezekiel, a commentary on Ezekiel, so I've got three out there, or will have. Studies in Isaiah, the road to captivity, and then uh, what I call exact Ezekiel. Uh, he did what God told him to do, and it was even though it was odd sometimes, and the uh, things that he was required to do, like lay on his side for a number of almost a year, uh, eat food only by measure, uh, cut his beard in thirds, and all these kind of things. Some of them were like crazy things. But the latter, the last thing that God asked him to do that was real test to him was when his wife died. The Lord told him, your wife will pass away this evening, but tomorrow you will not mourn. You will not shed a tear. You will walk among the people as if nothing happened. You will dress yourself as if nothing happened. He did that, and afterwards God gave him the 38th chapter of Ezekiel and the 44th chapter of Ezekiel. In the 44th chapter of Ezekiel, he laid out what's called the sons of Zadok. He said There's the, the ministry has been profligate. It is not what I asked them to do. So I'm separating the sons of Zadok. Minister to me, but the rest of the ministry may not minister to me. They may not come near me. They may not produce those things that are given of the Holy Spirit. So there was a separation made between those who who stood with the people and only did the things that clergy are supposed to do and those that ministered to him. The, the ones that ministered to him, the sons of Zadok, of course, I wrote a book entitled The Sons of Zadok. And the, the, the demarcation is made very clear. They separated the holy from the profane. And they walked in a holiness before God. And the Bible says, of course, later in the New Testament, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So there's a lot of ministry out there that is not holy. And, uh, you know, there's the separation. Ezekiel wanted to take out all the ones that were not holy. Just take them out, Lord, we'll start all over again. (laughs) And he said, oh, no, no, no. People need to have ministers to marry and bury and counsel with and take offerings and all that kind of thing. But only you may approach me. And I tell you what, I search for the sons of Zadok. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say something. I'll go out on a limb right now and say Rick Wilde is one of them. So praise the Lord for that combination. Uh, thank you, C.R. So all of them were ministers. Yes. But the Lord didn't allow all of those ministers to approach him. That is exactly correct. And he made that separation. And, of course, Jeremiah really does as well. He comes to the point where he said, uh, if you're uncircumcised of heart, whether you're Jew, 
following circumcision or whether you're a Gentile who never heard of a circumcised heart or circumcision. It doesn't matter. They're all in the same group because I'm looking for those with a circumcised heart where the flesh is cut away and the heart of the people is revealed to me in holiness. Of course, we get into that pretty fast uh, in the road to captivity. And I know that's what our uh, program is about today. So I'll, let me just steer you over into that and say a couple of words about Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel all together. Sure, go ahead. Isaiah in the 700 B.C., in that chronology, said that Assyria would come and take away the, 11, the 10 tribes to the north leaving only two tribes. And they had a choice. There's an, they would not be taken away by the Assyrians, scattered abroad like the ten northern tribes of Samaria. But they would have a, a brief reprieve, of maybe a hundred years. And they could repent during that period of time. If they didn't, they were going to be captured and taken away. And, of course, Jeremiah comes along, and he remembers what Isaiah had to say through the Spirit. And he said, we're living out what he said. You didn't repent, so here comes the problem. They were talking about an economic turndown or uh, some state of uh, economy that was difficult or unemployment or whatever we used to, or whatever we are accustomed to calling a downturn or collapse. But they weren't looking for what God was saying. God said to them, you keep on doing what you're doing, and you form a national mind that is against me and my mind. And captivity is the only result of it. You will be captured and carried away. Then comes along the captivity, and it takes out Ezekiel and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all the intellectuals, the intelligent young people, all the able-bodied people are ferreted off, and they just leave in the land those that were half-wits and those that didn't have any ambition at all or couldn't be motivated much except by whipping goad. And Ezekiel finds himself in slavery by the river Kibar and with a big question mark in his mind. How in the world did we wind up here? How did we start off being God's anointed people with our lovely Jerusalem and our wall city and all the countryside full of peace and prosperity. And we've been degraded to a point of captivity and we are slaves to a people that we don't even know. And here I am in a camp of Israelites hiding around doing menial tasks. How did that happen? And God showed him how and what. He blamed the clergy. He said, I point a finger at one thing. My prophets and my priests did not do what I told them to do. They did not call the people to a genuine repentance. So I lay on them more than any other group. I lay on them the responsibility for the captivity. And that's why it came along in the 44th chapter of Ezekiel and showed where the priests would come out of the offering place in the temple to their apartment and fall down before a sex god named Tammuz and worship that. When Ezekiel saw that, that's when he said, oh my God, why don't we just re replace all of them, get rid of it? And that's CR, when God that, separated the ministry. CR, can we compare that to today's plight where, according to my son, Jeremy, over 50% of the pastors in America admit that they have a porn addiction? Well, the parallels to what Jeremiah experienced with a nation in, in decline are uncannily like what we have in America today on many, many fronts. You see, that's the reason I wrote uh, this book under the anointing of the Spirit, and I think it's one of the best commentaries you can come across because it's hard-hitting and it takes it from a social point of view, takes it from an economic point of view, takes it from a religious point of view, a governmental, federal point of view, and it shows that we are, have made some of the same errors that Israel did 
that caused their captivity, but we expect to have a different outcome. Well, God calls that stupid. And I, I can show you the scripture that proves that. He uses that term altogether. He said, you're stupid to think that you can do the same thing they did with a different result. I'm the same God today as I was then. And there, when, my, when the national mind comes out evil, then that mind is against mine, and there comes to a point of no return, and after that there's captivity. And this is what I'm talking about. America stands in a place that, for the first time in her history when she could be captured and taken away. And that prospect is not looming on anybody's frontier. They think by changing government or changing uh, the program, and I'm all for that, but they believe that man's manipulation and some correction of e economics or something short of repentance is going to be enough. Well, it isn't enough. And God's wanting that message to get out to the people. You know, Josiah and Zedekiah were kings of Judah and Israel. And they thought the solution was just have a political alliance that's better or socially manipulate the crowds or have anything but a genuine repentance. But when the national mind is evil and finally expresses itself into a single national will, then God usually brings that nation to its knees. C.R., did, did America dodge a bullet last month? Were, were we granted a reprieve by the Lord? Yes. But we must remember that there's something else about that's about to happen. Rick, we're getting ready to enter, and I don't know how to express it any other way than this. We're getting ready to enter such a momentous time in history. Beginning right now, we're already in the early phases of it. But it will be the demarcation as great as the demarcation of Jesus' birth and death when he separated B.C. from A.D. Wow. Take some time. You've, you've got to explain it. Well, it's hard to explain because it's a, it's a understanding that we're in a, a period of great transition. And all history is spiritual history. I think David Barton uh, does a splendid job of providing people with understanding of that uh, cogent fact. But the spiritual, the spiritual decline of the entire world leaves it open to such a tremendous tribulation all across the very fact that Merkel and, and the Germans had all these problems and, and, there's a, and Trump recently, just a few hours ago, declared that this was a war on Christianity. This was a fight against Christianity. Well, he's exactly correct. Matter of fact, I have viewed Trump a little differently than some people. I know that his grandmother was in a great revival that took place in the Isle of Lewis in Scotland, where she lived. And that island in uh, the major city or major town of Barvis experienced an awakening of God that caused the bars to be emptied and the brothels to be closed and and the people fall on their knees before God and ask repentance before God out in fields. Donald didn't Trump's, have anybody preach to him at all. Donald Trump's mother was, or, or did you say his mother? Or his, his grandmother was That's in right. that revival. In that revival. And I think in his DNA, there's an anointing that comes down to the second and third generation of them that love him as well as those that curse him. So aside from that, when you look at the entire world, and the scene that we're seeing in every nation, not just not just the U.S., but in every nation through this tremendous migration and through other evidences that we see change taking place, uh, I, I believe we're at a point in history that we could teeter-totter in either direction, either that of continued freedom or that of captivity. Well, we go with this, we'll get out of speculation. Let me... <laughs> Let me let me just leave it with you like that and let the Holy Spirit open up the eyes and hearts of the people to understand. 
You know, when God begins to review his people with his prophet, you know, Jeremiah was the only prophet among many. There were hundreds of prophets throughout Israel. And they expressed themselves. Even the high priest, Pashur, expressed himself as not believing what Jeremiah said. But it didn't, it didn't matter because God gave Jeremiah an anointing early in his ministry that showed him that he was going to be with him no matter what. Of course, he gave Ezekiel a, a, a forehead like flint, which is almost necessary when you're dealing with religious people. And he gave the anointing of God from the womb out. He said, while you were still in your mother's womb, I anointed you with the Holy Ghost in power, and I'm going to be with you through all of this. Well, every time he gave a message, the king would throw him in prison. Every time he gave a message to the church, they wanted to kill him. So why are we uh, upset when we see the same kinds of activities taking place around us? We know that there's a message from God, but God said in in chapter 4, verse 22 of Jeremiah, for my people are foolish. Now, that's his people. He's the one called by his name. The ones that are in church, the stalwarts in the temple all the time. My people are foolish. They have not known me. They know about me. They've heard about me. They walk around me, but they are silly children, and they have no understanding, and they are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Wow. Silly children, playful, foolish, sottish, unwilling to take responsibility. Does that sound like anything in America today? (laughs) Yes, sir, it does. Silly Christians who claim to be, oh, God doesn't really mean that. I'm, I'm his. We're his children. Well, they gave the same excuse to Jeremiah. They said, what you said can't, ha- can't possibly happen. You're prophesying captivity. You're prophesying enslavement. Well, Jeremiah had to have Jeremiah 1.10 to go with. Because God said to him, this day set forward, I put you over the nations and over the kingdoms. And before the book of Jeremiah is finished, he lays out in rapid fire order all of the known nations during that period of time. And God tells him one principle that I believe is still operative. I know it's operative. It's any nation that comes against my people, my people. He's talking about Israel now, the Israel of God, not the Israel of a land geophysical area. The Israel of God and his people are those who are the Jesus people and who are the sons of Zadok. Those kind of people, the holiness ones. I'll come against any nation and they will be brought to an end because of their actions to my people. There's a lot in the book of Jeremiah, and the Lord has given me understanding and analysis of how it works. There are principles here that you can't find in other places in Scripture. Now, I will say this hurriedly. You won't hear many messages preached in pulpits from Jeremiah. That's for sure. I have a reason for saying that. If they, If Sunday morning, the fifth chapter of Jeremiah, were to be preached in the pulpits of just America, by Monday there would be an awakening take place in this nation. Now the reason I say that is simple. We're living in a time when people cannot tolerate the heavy message that is found in this book. But they need to. They need to grasp hold of the constructs that are in this book and realize what they're seeing around them. It will change their view of history. It will change their view of the national scene. It will change their view of the religious scene and help them understand. People will understand for the first time where they stand before God. Can I give you an illustration, Rick? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I was down in Curitiba, Brazil, 
I was preaching at the First Baptist Church there some years back. A prophetess lady in Oklahoma who followed our ministry over time. She and her husband were friends for 40 years. She's passed away now. She called me and she said, C.R., I want to tell you that I've been in prayer and intercession about your trip into Brazil this time. I know you've been there many times, but this one is peculiar. The Lord says that the church you're going to be assigned to, the key to it, is in Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. Well, at that time, I was not assigned to any church. So I took it with a grain of salt, and I was early in in the uh, work of the Holy Ghost. So I took the prophecy as a grain of salt. I looked at Jeremiah 5, and I thought, there's not much here for me to preach. So I'm not going to. Well, I got down there, and I found out I was assigned to the largest church the Baptist had. Theological seminary there had people who were in that church as well, all the professorial staff. And I looked out over the audience of about 1,200, and I thought, well, okay, I'm going to preach my little sugar sticks. They do good in the U.S. They're going to do good down here, and they did. We had people join the church. We had people salvation. We had people make changes in their life. Everybody was happy. Wednesday, I got down to the pulpit, and I was planning on preaching Revelation, the 12th chapter. My mind said, turn to Revelation 12. My mouth said, turn to Jeremiah 5. My interpreter looked at me, and he said, what on earth are you doing? I said, what did I say? He said, Jeremiah 5. You want me to go there or Revelation 12? I said, Jeremiah 5. He said, we haven't prepared Jeremiah 5. I said, I'm I'm far enough along in the Lord to know it doesn't take any preparation on my part when this moves in this direction. I want you to know, Rick, that I didn't get to the 10th verse hardly in the exposition of that chapter. When a man stood up on the second row, an elderly man, and cried out that the sins of his heart had overcome him and he fell in between the pews, people thought he was dead. There was a rush of people around him. We continued. Before that meeting was over, four and a half hours of repentance, tears, changing of hearts, people begging one another to forgive them. The pastor told me in broken English after the meeting was over, going out the door, you have touched on every sin in this church. I don't know how you knew, but I was not able, I just wasn't able spiritually to confront the people, but you've confronted everything that we have had a problem with. Now, who could do that except the Holy Ghost? And that's what we're expecting people who read this book to come away with, an understanding that Jeremiah is not for neophytes, but Jeremiah is telling the truth. And though all the other prophets during the day in which he lived, told him that he was a liar and the truth wasn't in him. Every word he gave was truth. Dr. Oliver, in in the 11th verse of Jeremiah 5, the Lord said, For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. What does it mean when God says that his people He's not talking about pagans. He's not talking about heathens. He's talking about the people who claim to be the Lord's people. What does it mean when the Lord says, you have dealt treacherously with me? First thing is presumption. You know, we presume a lot. The next part was that you have been elastic in your theology. And I think we come to the place where we realize that in today's marketplace of religion, things are being forgiven that God hasn't. You dealt treacherously with me, traitors. That which I thought was, which you you claim to have with me, you're exempling things that are not mine and teaching the people to do the same. The next part of it is daring God to do what he says he'll do. I believe that we 
look at that passage of scripture in the fifth chapter, and I and I dare say that in my commentary, if they can get from chapter one through five, then they can get all the way through the fifty chapters that are involved in in uh, Jeremiah's treatise, because there's going to be such questions as faithfulness and defilement. There's going to be uh, prognostications from God. For instance, one of the things he told Jeremiah was that Israel was holiness in the Lord, and being a was is not a now. Past experience doesn't mean anything. The, f the fact that you were once holy doesn't mean you are holy now. It doesn't mean that the message you're preaching today is the is the holiness of the Lord to a people of the Lord. My people have committed two evils, he said in chapter 2. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they don't have a container of the things of God, and neither have they sought out the refreshing water that comes from me. You know, when Jesus said to his disciples, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water, I expect those rivers, those, that fountain of living water to come out of me. When I preach, I expect that to happen. In the pulpits of America, they don't expect that to happen. But sadly, I say that, my brother. So did Jeremiah. They called him the weeping prophet. The reason he wept was he wasn't disassociated with the people and their problems. He did not separate himself from the, you know, and live in an ivory tower set up. He didn't, he didn't cloister the robes of clergy about himself. He lived with the people. And he wept and mourned, and he said his tears flowed down his face continually for his people. But he still brought the message. He called him a degenerate plant of an alien vine. And when Jesus told his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches, he was reconnecting with God's people. He was reconnecting. They weren't an alien vine. The disciples were a true vine. You know, I found that Charles Finney wrestled with some of the same things we're wrestling with today. In 1825, he wrote he was holding a meeting in Boston, and he was being filled with the Holy Ghost and power. And he came to his diary, and he wrote these words in his diary, and thank God we have them. I have found that nowhere can I preach the truths on which my own soul delights to live and be understood, except it be for a small number. Then later on, he said, I found the churches in so slow state as to be utterly incapable of apprehending and appreciating what I regard as the most precious truths of the whole gospel. Oh, Rick, there we are. There's where we stand as a nation. There's where the world stands as a Christian. The Christianity throughout the world is weak. But they're called upon to be strong in some nations. And we're seeing a separation is taking place. They saw it in their day. Dr. Oliver, um, one theme that runs throughout Jeremiah and and the other Old Testament prophets, was God weeping, begging, begging the people to come back to him. You know, so many Christians say the Old Testament is, uh, you know, the image of God is that he's stern and and unloving. And I'm like, what, are you reading the same books I'm reading? Because I, oh my, yeah. I see nothing but his love in the Old Absolutely. Testament. He begged, he pleaded. He, he said, I don't want to judge you. Come back and, and don't go the path that you're going on. In, in Jeremiah 6, he said, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, 
Then you will find rest for your souls. But the people said, we will not walk in it. Well, they looked at Jeremiah, and they gave him three examples. He said, I'm not polluted. It was in their own words, we've done nothing wrong. We are lords. We exercise authority under God because we are lords unto him. And we are innocent. We're hearing that same thing today, brother. And what they're trying to do is is uh, defend themselves against a God who is saying, I'm not against you, I'm for you. But I judge that you have a harlot's forehead. You're playing around where you shouldn't. You're selling out the things that don't have any reasoning behind them. You become haughty, worldwide, rebellious, self-serving, experienced in deception, agendized, immoral. You have a seared conscience. Well, a profligate national character begins to rise out. One of the things I've been so grateful for during this election time and I've been asking God, thank you. I've been saying, Lord, thank you for bringing it up. I asked early on, Lord, let all the corruption that's beneath the surface come to the top and let America see it. Well, we've certainly been inundated <laughs> more of it than we thought. I think some people were ready to vomit. It was so disgusting. Yes. You know, Jeremiah has a lot of if-then clauses to the eye that's accustomed to uh, the writing, an if-then clause is, is a beautiful, beautiful thing of reprieve. And Jeremiah 4, if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. If you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, then you will live. How simple that is. It's to humble yourself before God and say, we've been wrong. If you have put away your abominations. But no, treacherous Jew, <laughs> return to your backsliding Israel. That's what Jeremiah's called them, backslidden. You have pure, procured. Here's the scripture, Jeremiah 4.18. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. In other words, you've bought them. This is your wickedness because it's bitter, because it reaches to your heart. You own this judgment by design of your own bringing about. Then God says, I have purposed and I will not relent, nor will I turn from it. In other words, increasing in crime and debauchery and moral depredation. They were not causes, they were symptoms of the problem. Because you see, I opened my book with a little quote from Carl Jung, that at the base of every uh, aber mental aberration is an unresolved spiritual issue. Well, it can be said of the national mind as well. When the national mind is evil, the very heart and root of the matter is an unresolved religious problem. And until there's an awakening and a turning back toward God, there is no solution. It may be a reprieve for a time to give us some time to find a mark. Let's talk about this reprieve that you and I are both in agreement was granted by God to uh, the American people because of the intercession of the saints. Do we have a biblical pattern of how long a reprieve typically lasts? Well, we know that Isaiah preached in the 700s B.C. and Jeremiah came along in the 580s. But he preached for 40 years. And God gave during the time he was in authority as the only prophet in Israel. That's 40, that's 40 years of reprieve right there. And 40 seems to be... a a workable number. Now, have we been in that period of time for some time? I don't know. I don't know how far along we are. But I do know that there's hope. That even though Michelle said there's hopelessness, we we have hope in him. Of course, one of the things that, that uh, Jeremiah took in was this construct of hopelessness. And he said that's the opposite of faith. 
you know, <laughs> one of the great things about Jeremiah is that he reaches into every avenue, every area that might be away from God and calls it what it is and says gives a solution. One of the things I love about him is the fact that he points out the long-suffering of God. And he even begins to pray a national prayer in behalf of the people of, of Judah and Benjamin. And God stopped him and said, stop that. I'm not going to hear your prayer. I don't care if Moses was here and Samuel was here. I'm not going to hear them either. So there comes a time when the intermediary period is eroded. Now, how close we are to that, I don't know, because we've been fooling around on God for a long time in this nation. I mean, I'm 81 years old. I look back over 50 years or more of hearing ministry, and I think there's been a decline in ministry ever since we came to the part where we make sociology and psychology the major authority in our in our activities. We want to know what the majority looks like. We want to find out what the what the uh, studies require. Your iniquity have turned away my godliness. Your sins have withheld good things from you. This is a scripture. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. Their houses are full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and grown rich. They've grown fat and they are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. Shall I not punish them for these things? Shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? See, I want to get across to America that we haven't eclipsed that point of judgment. We may have a reprieve, all right. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. What will be their end? That's Jeremiah. That's why I say if if the American pulpit would come to Jeremiah 5 on Sunday, there'd be a repentance like nobody ever realized on Monday, because there has to be. Dr. Oliver, there there is a, there is a movement within uh, the church and the evangelical church in America uh, that some people have labeled hyper grace. I would say the, the uh, number one proponent of that doctrine is Joseph Prince. And we're probably opening up a can of worms here, but Joseph, open it up. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Let's open it up. Let them out. Um, Joseph Prince teaches that there is no need to repent after salvation. Well, I'm glad he preaches that, but it isn't truthful. And uh, I think Jeremiah ran into the same problem with a guy named Hananiah. If I can flip over in, a, in my book here to where I handle that a little bit, I want to read. I want to read you some scriptures related to that. Jeremiah was preaching the need for repentance. Okay. And he was right before God because God said, I'm going to make you fire and the people wood, and they're going to listen to you, and they're going to know the tr- that there's one fellow in Israel that's speaking the truth. Well, the greatest opposition, the greatest opposition that Jeremiah had was with the clergy. It was bad enough that the kings put him in prison, but the clergy wanted to kill him. And Hananiah comes along as a prophet and said, well, I've had dreams and things and I've had my visions and I have my theology and I've gotten them from God. And the Lord said in the 27th chapter of Jeremiah, therefore do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your sorcerers, your sorcerers, who speak to you saying you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For they prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your land and I will drive you out, and you will perish. Now hear this. Ananiah came against him. 
and I broke the yoke symbol that was on his back as a symbol to Israel of what, what would happen to them. And here's his response. Here's Jeremiah's response. Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. I say get ready. I was brought into on the carpet by the seminary in Kurochiba. I was told after that meeting where the Holy Ghost fell in great power that I had ruined one of their best churches and that they would see that I never spoke again in the nation of Brazil among the Baptists. You know what happened, Brother, Brother Rick, the person that was confronting me with that? I said, may the Lord judge between you and me. Because I knew that what I did and what God had put in my heart to do, even though I didn't understand it at first, I understood it enough that when we called for it, we declared it. They died within the year. Look out, America. Look out, clergy. If we begin to pray as we ought, judgment's going to fall in places we've never seen it fall before. Now, that's just free. All through Isaiah, all through Jeremiah, and all through Ezekiel, God said, I blame the clergy. I blame the pastors. I blame the prophets. I blame those that sold themselves out to others. I blame them, the religious hierarchy. I blame them. Is America exempt? Pardon me, is the world exempt? Hananiah wasn't exempt. God took his life. Pasher wasn't exempt. Pasher was the high priest. He came against him. But God gave Jeremiah a, a peculiar task. And you find this when you find the chapter that deals with the Rechabites. He said, invite the Rechabites to a wine supper at the temple in the finest room you can find in there that you can get for a rental. And invite them to this wine supper and have them sit down and you tell them that the Lord told you to do this. Make sure they understand that it comes from God. So all the credibility of, Je of Jeremiah was in this move. Sent out invitation, and the sons of Rechab came, the Rechabites. They sat down, and the wine was poured in front of them, and they said, we will not take this wine. Jeremiah said, now, wait a minute. I'm aware of the oath that you took with your father that you would not touch wine and you would not, none of your children would touch wine, nor would you build houses in the land. I recognize that. But God told me on the credibility of I'm his prophet and you know that I am, God told me to invite you to this supper and if it was to be a wine supper. You know what modern reasoning would have said, Rick? Modern reasoning would have said, well, I guess that oath is over. If God really told him this and we feel that he's truthful in saying it, then we ought to go ahead and drink it. But they didn't do it. They said, no, to our father, I don't care who told you what. We're not taking any wine into our bodies and we're through with this banquet. God met them immediately. And the prophet gave them this prophecy said, because you honored the oath and stood by the oath you made with your father. And you became an example to Israel who took their oaths before me and did nothing like them. Who broke them on every occasion and mentioned back in that treasure part that you were discussing. I will never have a generation uh, that there isn't somebody of the, the Rechabites 
ministering to me. Now, if you want to know who I'd like to be kin to, I'd like to be kin to those Rechabites. I'd like to have my genealogical pattern go back to Rechab because they stood as an example of what it means to take an oath before God and be in covenant with Him. So, CR, let's let's bring this up to present day, a modern world. Are, are are you saying that what this is teaching is that that when we make a vow to God, there may be times that God actually confronts us to see if we will keep the vow? That's right. See, we're told by modern clergy that God doesn't bring those kind of things, but I can prove by Jeremiah that he does. He has an arsenal of famine, sword, and pestilence. And he brought that on his own people, his own nation. He did it after a long period of time. A long period of time, but he did bring it. And it was God who brought it, and God who owned up to the fact that he did bring it and told his prophet to tell him that. You know, the gibberishites, I call them that because you'll find that term in my book, are all of the clergy who make all these promises, but they're outside the will and purpose of God. And I think we have a plethora of them today. We have a tremendous uh, onslaught of religious thought being promoted. Now, not everybody's evil and bad and uh, ugly. A lot of those that are promoting it are not. Their minds and hearts have been touched by other spirits. But I tell you what, when you begin to walk as Jeremiah walked, answerable to God, when you walk as Ezekiel walked, who had to be exact in whatever he did before the Lord, when you walk and see what happened to them and how they operated in the society that was profligate around them, you begin to realize that Israel didn't change from even being captive, that they rebelled against God under Isaiah, they continued it under Jeremiah, and when they went into captivity, here is Ezekiel dealing with a people that is still rebellious in heart and hard-hearted. And it makes you wonder, what, what is an awakening of God? Well, it's something different. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to reach over here and pull up a resource that I was just reading in before our broadcast in which they define what revival really was. And I'm not sure I have that right at my fingertips, but let me see. This. Let me tell you what I mean by revival, says Duncan Camel. An evangelistic campaign and special meeting is not revival. In a successful evangelistic campaign or a crusade, there will be hundreds or even thousands of people making decisions for Jesus. But the community remains untouched, and the churches continue much the same as they were before the outreach. But in revival, God moves in, and suddenly the community becomes God-conscious, and the Spirit of God grips men and women in such a way that even work is given up as people give themselves to waiting upon God. In the midst of the Lewis, Isle of Lewis awakening, the parish ministers even saw his presence in the homes of the people out in the meadows, in the moorland, in the public roads. This presence of God was a supreme characteristic of a God-sent revival of the hundreds who found Jesus during this time. Seventy-five percent were saved, saved before they came near a meeting or heard a sermon or any other testimony. You're quoting Duncan Campbell, and this is the man of God that, Correct. that the Lord used in that great revival on the Isle of Lewis, and you're, you re, you told us earlier in the program that Donald Trump's grandmother was part of that revival. That is correct. She became the holiness part of, of the Presbyterians. And there is a holiness part of them. See, are, are there times when God tells his servants not to pray for the people? Absolutely. I mentioned one of them. One of the times was if Moses or Samuel came and gave a petition 
See, Jeremiah said that. Jeremiah went to the Lord with a national prayer, and God told him, don't pray that. I'm not going to hear it. I will not listen to it. They've eclipsed the time. I mean, I've got a thousand notes sitting in front of me here that all of them capture my attention. I hate to say to the congregation, but I also don't. They ought to get this book because this book will change your life. It changed mine writing it, and it'll change your reading it. CR, how can how can our audience get a copy? The book is The Road to Captivity. How can they get a copy? Well, online, if they go to Amazon Kindle or Nook Press and uh, type in my name, CR Oliver, it'll take them over to where they can buy any of our books online, or they can uh, contact us at that Art Publications. Or they can call uh, 936-230-3543. All right. Say that, say that again and say it slower this time. 936-230-3543. All right. Or zadokpublications.com. And that's Z-A-D-O-K. Right. I want our audience to know, if, if this is the first time you've heard Dr. Oliver, and we have so many new listeners that have joined the True News family since the last time he's been here. But every single book this man writes will bless your soul. And I'm telling you, that, that is a true statement. I believe it. They, I cherish his books. They are rich in spiritual. Bless you, brother. They are. They well, are. I remember what one fellow said many years ago when I was a young man. He said, I am so disappointed with Christian literature. There's a mountain of paper and a river of ink for a teaspoon full of knowledge. <laughs> and I think about, about that when I write, and I thought, Lord, this is not going to be that mountain of paper without a knowledge. They're going to find something on every page. They're going to see that God is in Revelation. And I'm not egotistical enough to believe that I am the last word on any of this. I'm believing that God will take and use the things and thoughts that are brought out in these books as springboards. And you'll say, well, I hadn't thought about that before, and the Holy Spirit can take that and modify it or make it different or make it applicable to your own life. In other words, it'll be a help to you. Absolutely. And if, if, you are a, uh, if you're a Sunday school teacher or you have a Bible study class or you're a home cell church leader, this book, The Road to Captivity, that's a 12-week Bible study course. Because you could get this book, and you could teach from the book of Jeremiah for 12 weeks, one chapter per week, and you would bless your, your Bible study group. And if they all got a copy of it, uh, they will be different men and women by the time they finish this book, The Road to Captivity. The author is Dr. C.R. Oliver. The phone number is 936-230-3543. It's ZadokPublishing.com. And, of course, it's on Amazon and all the online bookstores. You know, Rick, you mentioned the 12-week course. I wrote a, a companion little book that goes along with it, a handbook, study guide. And it's set up for a 12-month study if you're in a home group that wants to take a little bit at a time. And each section has uh, four sections in it for each one of the weeks within a month. And, uh, you know, coming back from a teaching background, I've just taken and made it a working syllabus so that if you wanted to teach this, you could go with it a number of directions. And I'm glad you pointed that out. I hadn't planned on it. Yes, sir. I know a lot of our uh, True News fans are... You know, they're conducting their own Bible studies, and some of them are home cell church leaders and uh, Sunday school teachers. I'm telling you, this is a fantastic teaching on the book of Jeremiah. You you won't have to worry about any um, false doctrine in this book. It will take people Amen. deep. Well, I know we're on our third printing, so that's a pretty good indication. Yeah, praise God. That's good to hear. Well, Dr. Oliver, so good to hear from you. Merry Christmas. So welcome uh, back anytime. Thank you for that. We love you, brother, and we we want to support your ministry in 2017. What a wonderful job you've done in 2016. We bless you. Thank you so much.
Well, thanks, Pastor Rick, for that interview. And this interview was pre-recorded, and so we're presenting it as a special presentation for our listeners this week, the final week of 2016. And since it is the final week of 2016, if you've not had the opportunity yet to get your end-of-the-year giving in, we'd like to encourage you to do so. The best way to do that is to visit our website at truenews.com. That's T-R-U-N-E-W-S dot com. And on the homepage there, right at the top, right below the True News banner, you're going to see a red button that says Donate. And you can quickly and easily fill out some information there. We make it very easy for you to give, and you can help us out with an end-of-the-year gift. I'd also like for you to prayerfully consider making a monthly commitment of a set amount for 2017. You know, make it a resolution. Make it a promise. Make it a faith promise. Uh, Challenge God. Put God on alert that you're giving, and let Him bless you here in the coming year. Now, if you're using a mobile device, it's very easy to give there as well. Just go to the Apple or Android stores, download our app to your phone, and on the app, you're going to see a a heart button at the bottom. Just touch our heart like we're touching yours, and you can give right there on your mobile device. Once again, we make it quick, easy, simple, not complicated at all. We want it to be easy. Now, I know a lot of people still like to mail in their gifts, and we still go get our mail every day. And we'd like to encourage you, if that's your preferred method, we make it easy for you as well. The mailing address for True News is P.O. Box 690069, Vero Beach, Florida, 32969. That's True News, P.O. Box 690069, Vero Beach, Florida, 32969. Now, checks, money orders, you know, those are fine if you are considering sending precious metals to us we do ask that you give us a call here at our office we do have special instructions for individuals who are looking to ship precious metals Um, just we have some special packing instructions that kind of help you out we don't want there to be any problems with you being able to ship your items to us and everything we want to make sure you get proper credit for what you sent so just give us a call here at the office and we'll give you some advice on the best way that you can get those precious metals to us as well Well, God bless you. This has been a great episode of True News today. And we want to encourage you once again to let us know if we've been a blessing to you. Write us, call us, email us, and let us know that True News has meant something in your life. I'm Dr. Burkhart sitting in for Pastor Rick Wiles. God bless you.